Conflict is a part of life, right? And when you're young, there's a few essential conflicts you will go through when you're a child. Great debates you'll enter into. Who's the strongest? Who's the fastest? Who's the smartest? My dad can beat up your dad. These are all things that we go through in our life. They're essential. There is one chief debate, one chief conflict, all of us that were young entered to, and this is not even gender specific. Which superhero power is the greatest? You've had it. We've all had it. I remember heated debates when I was young. You always say super strength, invisibility, super speed. Flight is a big one. How many flight people out there? There is one strength I know. It may not be the most fun. But I believe trumps them all. The most significant strength that's underrated, and that is the ability to see the future. That's super strength. I know all you Marvel people are debating that right now. You DC people are like, no, and this is the reason why. There is one illustration that ends this debate for everyone. Spoiler alert. In Marvel's Avengers... As Thanos has the fate of the universe in his hands, it is not Captain America, it is not Thor, it's not Iron Man, it is Doctor Strange that saves the fate of humanity. Why? Because he knew the future. Well, wasn't it Iron Man that did it? No, it was his one plan. He saw all possibilities. He knew. See, there's something inside of us where we long to know what's next. We want to know. See, uncertainty is unsettling. When you don't know what's ahead, uncertainty is unsettling. And I believe, though we're not equipped, we're not omniscient, I believe that desire is in all of us because we're designed to be in a covenantal, communion-based relationship with a God that knows all things. And when you're in a sure covenant, and the one you're called to be in a relationship with knows what's next, you don't need to worry. So innately in all of us, we want to know what's next because we're designed to be in that covenant with that creator. You can remove Thanos and Dr. Strange. See, I, I believe that there's uncertainty is in us has produced this entire market of predictions. There's whole industries based off predictions. Sports betting, stock market, weather. Dear Lord, help us with the weather. Welcome to spring, Roseville. Come on. And see, there's all these industries that are based off predictions. And 2020 was a benchmark year for predictions. When you look in the last hundred years, for some reason, the year 2000 and the year 2020 were the chief years for predictions of certain technologies. Here are the top 10 quick, absurd predictions of 2020. Let me know if you saw any of these come to pass. One surgeon in 1911 said, human feet will just be one big toe. All extra toes would be removed. We'll all have animals as chauffeurs and servants. We'll live in flying houses, one man said. Here's an absurd one. We'll eat candy made of underwear. They believe that you could take any unused garment to factories in the future, the year 2020, and turn them into imperishable, shelf-stable food products like candy. There you go. Bon appetit. We'll all have personal helicopters. No one will work. Everybody will be rich because we have robots. Everyone will stop drinking coffee and tea. Sorry, Nikola Tesla, you missed that one. Eating will no longer be necessary. This is early 2000s because they believed nanobot technology would be in your body, removing all waste and repairing all cells, therefore eliminating hunger. We'll have robots as therapists. And lastly, this is my favorite. Women will be built like wrestlers. I don't know. <laughs> These are obscene predictions. Obscene. People made money off of this. People made New York Times bestsellers off of some of these predictions. And now I know in 2019, when you looked at 2020, there were so many. This was the year of vision. This was the year of clarity. There was so much said about it. And people, again, look back and they say, well, I said this. No, no one predicted businesses would close. No one predicted schools would close. Churches would close. Unemployment would skyrocket. No one predicted in the present age of our technological advances that we would feel the most isolated, lonely, disconnected, and depressed we've ever been in our nation's history. 
No one thought that this benchmark year of innovation and change would lead to difficulty. 2020 was not a paradise. It was a wilderness. It was a drought. It was a famine. It was a desert for many people. You say, well, my 2020 was fine. God bless you. It was the hardest year for most of my friends in my own personal life. No doubt. And see, I've, I've started to talk to people and process that last year as you exercise the discipline of reflection. And there's this subtle deception that is creeping in. This is the deception that the devil had his way last year. There's this subtle deception that the devil had his way. It was his work. I've, I've sensed that. And it was confirmed for me last week when I saw a commercial. And in this commercial for Match.com, here is this absurd Satan figure with this woman that walks up to him as he's standing underneath a bridge. And she says, Satan? And she says, and he says, 2020? And then they match and they go on all these dates together as everything's shut down. See, there's something interesting. You always have to keep your antennas up to what culture is communicating to you. The reason why that even passed a marketing team is because they all knew there were other forces at work last year. But the deception is that the devil had his way. No, 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 no. Upon the cross, he was dethroned from his kingdom. Upon the cross, he is not Lord. Yahweh is. He alone. And this deception comes in that the devil had his way. And that's bad theology. Yeah, last year was a desert, but Revelation 12 says clearly, verse 8, the devil and his angels were defeated. And there was no longer any place in them for heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpents who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. They were thrown down and John receives this revelation as he sees this scene in heaven. Now again, revelation is hotly debated. And people could say, well, it was, it was, it was fulfilled in the past or partially in the past or it's all for the future. Here's the bottom line. The book of Revelation has been an encouragement for every generation as they face their end time. For every generation. And you have this unique illustration of the woman that we believe is Israel in the church gives birth to the Messiah that becomes the ruler. And this rage is filled within Satan and his angels as they've been thrown and cast down to the earth, removed from their position of authority that was abdicated by Adam and given over to them. Verse 12. Rejoice then you heavens and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you with great wrath. Because we know and he knows his time is short. Although the devil's on the loose, he is not Lord. He's not in charge. God has equipped his church to overcome. And as Paul says in Romans 15, that Satan would soon be crushed under your feet. We have position and confidence and power. Now, obviously, as we look back at 2020, it was a difficult year, but it was a desert. And see, the enemy's on the loose. The devil's on the loose in the desert. But it's not him that leads us there. It's the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the one. God allowed a drought. God allowed a wilderness. God allowed a famine that we might seek him. And that all those things that you've put your dependency on would be stripped away and your dependency would solely be upon him. That was the purpose of it. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you. Into the desert in order to what? To humble you. Testing you to know what was in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commandments. You say, well, that's obviously Old Testament. Well, that's specifically for Israel, and here's why. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So are you implying that Jesus needed to be humbled? 
You implying that Jesus needed the, the wilderness or he needed the desert? No, Jesus picked off where Israel failed. Jesus picked up the unfulfilled assignment of Israel. And as you notice this great battle in the desert, Jesus marks the way, he paves the way, and he restores all that he failed to do in Deuteronomy 8. There's a direct mirroring here. And as we go through our own personal desert, and people say, well, didn't Jesus fulfill it for us? You look at every significant New Testament character, they went through a desert. They go through a wilderness. Look at Peter's life, his denial. Paul in Arabia. Every one of us are designed to go through a desert, to go through a wilderness. And God said, hey, I know some of you, your life's been hard. This is going to be a universal wilderness for his church. His church is going to enter the desert together collectively because he really wanted us to have community. So many of us have endured deserts and wilderness on our own. Last year, it was a reset that we all start together. And now as we're coming out of this desert, as we come out of this wilderness, what does it say in Luke chapter 4? He returned with the spirit and power. He returned to fulfill Isaiah 61. And it says he sat down and he instructed, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news. That's what he's done. We've not seen that demonstrated in the church yet. But we have to cry out and hunger for it. You see, as we're led to the desert, he begins to strip all these things away. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. He humbled you by letting you hunger. How many experienced hunger last year? Then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted. I love that phrase. The revelation that God has for you today will be foreign to those that were before you. It doesn't mean we're rewriting scripture. That's not what I'm implying here. There is a word, a rhema word you need now. You need it now for tomorrow and those old things you used to have in the past or when you used to seek the Lord back in high school, they won't matter much for today. They won't. You can't bring your letterman jacket from back in the day when you were in a revival. You have to walk in the now word that the Holy Spirit has for you. In order to make you understand that one does not what? Live by bread alone. By every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Every word. This rhema word is designed for us and he is speaking. And one thing I can guarantee I heard collectively amongst my friends is God spoke last year. You just may not have seen him or felt him. He was speaking. I heard people giving me dreams and sharing words that God was speaking to them personally. The spirit is speaking. Are your ears open to hear? Are you listening? Are you attentive? Are you looking? Are you seeing God speak in a clear and precise way? Because he will. It just may not be how you're used to hearing it or in the way you want to hear it. The spirit is speaking. We need the rhema of word. Jesus overcomes that. He denies the temptation of turning the stones to bread, which he was able to do. But then we have another unique thing take place. He's taken up to this high point and he commands him to be thrown down. He says, well, hey, won't your angels come out and protect you? You won't cast your foot upon a stone. He quotes a scripture, Psalm 91. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. And he knows how to distort it. See, what God does is he brings us into the deserts. He brings us into these wilderness seasons. And we find this theme all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament. And in particular, this theme is found in the Psalms. And studying this week, I came across this Psalm. Psalm 107, verse 4. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to an inhabited town. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Verse 6. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He brings you into the place of desertedness, into the desert, into the wilderness, into the famine. As you look around that you might cry out to him. That's the chief principle of all the Psalms. Is turning all your commitments, all your heart to the Lord that you might cry out to him. And what I noticed last year. Is that in the midst of this famine, in the midst of this desert, 
these lies started to surface in a lot of my friends' lives. I saw this scripture get quoted here. Now again, not this scripture, but Psalm 107 talks about the cry. We hear this petition, this call to prayer all throughout the Psalms. One of the most misinterpreted words used in the Psalms to describe longing for the Lord and prayer is the word desire. Tell me if you heard this verse last year. Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This verse is a beautiful verse in context. Outside of context, it's a wicked deception. I heard so many people last year say, but God has put these desires in my heart. Why would it keep me from them? If God has given me this passion, why won't he fulfill this passion? And just like Satan quoted Psalm 91, he quoted Psalm 37 to a lot of people last year. And just like he came to Adam and Eve in the garden, did God really say? And that fruit looked great. You saw lots of people last year give in to their desires. That has nothing to do with this verse. The chief understanding of desire in the Psalms is that you would delight yourself in the Lord. One thing that I desire, that which I would seek, that I might dwell in your house, is to be in communion with the Spirit of God. That's the longing. That's the chief desire. And what he does is he uses the desert to strip all things away. All those things you've depended on, that he might distill your desires into his. He strips them down. He focuses your heart. And that desire produces fire within. That's what it's for. That fire is birthed within. And you begin to cry out to the Lord. You begin to push away all those idols that you've attached your life to. I remember reading 1 John 5 when I was young. And it closes, be weary, little children. Beware. Keep yourself from idols. And I said naively, what idols? I'm in America. What idols do we have? We have all these things we sacrifice our lives on. These altars of wickedness, of our job, of affluence, being an influencer. We all put this all on the altar of our life. Lord says, what have you given your affection to? And he distills our desires down as we learn to cry out to him. This is what I'm praying for, for his church. That we see the fulfillment of Psalm 107, verse 35. He's the one that turns deserts into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry live and they establish a town to live in. What's the modern understanding of this? How does this impact the New Testament? A couple weeks ago, I was reading through my Proverbs a day to keep the devil away. You know that. Proverbs 5, verse 15. Drink from your own well. Drink from your own cistern. I heard the Lord say, build the well within. We are called to be springs of living water. And as he draws his ecclesia out of the desert, as we begin to cry out to him, he begins to bring flowing rivers of life and waters through his church that we might see the power we're called to contend for. As we come collectively in Acts 2 communities, believing for the fulfillment of the New Testament church, we will see living water take place that a dry and weary land, a dry and weary culture might draw from. As you're coming out of this year and you're looking for what's next, cultivate the well, dig the well within. Cry out to the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, his desires. His presence, his spirit, they're far greater than any great 401k, I promise you.